Psalm 23. So we are technically not named after Psalm 23, but uh, Psalm 23, we're going to talk about more, way more in depth next week, but it really is who we are as a church. Um, when I was growing up, uh, I went to this church, and we had th- they had this pastor that was there forever, and I don't know if you've ever been part of some of these churches where that pastor was like a rock star. That guy was like, he would walk in the room with his suit, he rolled in with his Cadillac, Literally, and it was like senior pastor on the thing, and uh, we're gonna get one of those, and um, not a Cadillac, no. Um, and uh, he would roll in, and he was like so talented, and people were just like, wow. Then he moved on and moved up out of North Dakota, and uh, then we had this interim guy who was like 30 years older than the other guy, but just like the sweetest guy ever, sweetest pastor. And every Sunday, uh, he would come up to the the pulpit. That's what we called it back then. And uh, he would say, this is the day, the, he was kind of from the south, I don't have a very good southern accent, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Like 30 seconds. Like that one, <laughs> that, that verse, this is the day the Lord has made, let us rejoice and be glad in it. And he, every single Sunday, that's how we started out. Um, and it was always funny. We was, used to be like, okay, how long is he going to go this time? He would just draw it out for dramatic effect. Um, and, uh, and today we're going to really kind of talk about that verse. That this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Anyone have kind of a wild morning so far? Anyone? Wild morning? Oh, this, we, we did. Puke it. We had kids puking all night. We had trying to text people to come help us, please. Um, and uh, God's faithful, though. But this is the day the Lord has made. And so the, the, the year has been so far talking about this idea of today. That today is the day and now is the time that God wants to do something in and through us as a church and us as, a, as individuals um, that he doesn't want to wait anymore. That God wants to do something today. So when we say today that this is the day that the Lord has made, let us rejoice and be glad in it. There's an anticipation of what God can do today. There's something that God wants to do that, that I don't think we even fully understand or can see yet, but God wants to do it, and I'm excited about that. So today we call Vision Sunday, and um, it's just something you say because you run out of ideas of what to call things. So Vision Sunday, what are we going to do on Sunday? Talk about the vision. There we go. Um, that was a joke. <laughs> <sighs> okay, we're, it's going to be okay. So today is the day, is our vision. Um, And we really feel that God has spoke some things prophetically to us for this year. So for those of you who don't know what that word means, prophetically is God speaking to his people for something that is going to happen, for something that he has in the plan or in the works, right? So we believe that God speaks to his people. We believe that if God didn't speak to us, if we didn't have a relationship with us, we could just be like a really nice club full of cool people. But we have access to heaven, And we have a connection to Jesus that our Savior that we serve, the Savior that we love, is with us. And he wants to talk to each and every one of us. Maybe not in a booming, audible voice, but but in our thoughts and in our hearts and in our relationship with him. So today is the day that the Lord has made. We believe that God has called us to do something mighty this year. So so we're going to talk about that. Let's pray. Father, I just pray that you would speak your words that you would clarify all of our minds and our hearts to hear what you would have to say today. Thank you so much that this is the day that you have made, that you have made for us, that you have made, and, and there's so much beauty and wonder in what you have for us today. God, help us to rejoice and be glad in it. And we love you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Psalm 118. We'll, we'll read a couple of verses. We've been reading through the book of Daniel. Has that been kind of interesting, reading through the book of Daniel? Um, it's, I read it before, but when I read it, read, it, read it this time, I was like, wow, this is actually so crazy. You know, like sometimes you read it, you're like, okay, I heard that one before. And then reading it again, I'm like, man, this is insane to think about these, these young men who are taken out of their land, and then God, through the next 50 years, just kept blessing them and promoting them and guiding them, and all the while, they kept serving him. And all the while, they kept not, not moving to the left or to the right of what people would want him or them to be or the culture that they were trying to become like, but they would just stay true to who they were and who they are as, as people of God. And God just kept blessing and kept just promoting and kept doing these things. 
And there's something deeply profound about that in our lives. So we're going to read this here. Psalm 118, verse 19. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. These, this is a celebratory psalm. This isn't like, God, where are you? But you're going to come through. Or, God, uh, we don't know what's happening, but we know that you're faithful and you're true and your promises and do it forever. This is a psalm of celebration. God, we are coming into your presence. We are going to be connected to you. We are, there's not going to be a disconnect anymore. There's not going to be a, I think you're over there, God, but we're just trying to figure it out. There is a, there is a tightness and connection to this psalm. To open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. God has opened the gates to you. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. Our righteousness isn't in what we do, but in who we stand for and who we believe in, right? Our righteousness is found in Jesus Christ alone, which is a good sound, right? I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. Verse 22, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. So throughout the scripture, so this is a thousand, year, a thousand years probably before the coming of Christ. But all through the Old Testament, there's this, there's this concept, and even in the New Testament, uh, there's a kind of uh, theme of the idea of Christ is the cornerstone. And in, even in, in the book of Psalm, Psalms, it's saying, listen, some people are going to reject this, this rock, this stone, but he, but he is actually the cornerstone of everything. Some, some of those translations translates cornerstone to like the headstone. And really the cornerstone is like the most important rock that goes when you build a house, or the most important part, the foundation. The thing that everything is built upon. The thing that, thing that we start with, right? So like the wise man builds his house upon the rock, right? Have you heard that song? It's pretty good. The wise man builds his house upon the rock, right? Not upon the sand. Everything that we do in our life has to be built around something. And scripture is very clear about Jesus is the cornerstone, the center stone, the center of everything we build upon. And if Jesus is not the center of that, we miss out on the things that he wants to do. And we build our house on something that isn't fully sound and isn't fully going to hold up when things get rough. Jesus is the cornerstone. Ephesians 2 says this, So, when, so then you are, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints, and you are members of God's household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Jesus Christ himself as the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together, grows into a holy temple of the Lord. In him, you also are being built together into the dwelling place by God, dwelling place for God by the Spirit. So Jesus is our center. So we believe that God has a great plan for this year, for us to experience him more than we ever have before each day but we will not, we'll miss out on that opportunity. We'll miss out on some of the great things that God has if Jesus is not the center of your life. If it doesn't come down to like, okay, all these things are kind of up in the air and I'm trying to figure out life, but one thing I know for sure is I just love Jesus. And I know that Jesus died for me. And I know that Jesus is real. And I know that, that I don't have this kind of like distant relationship with this God. I kind of figure out because I see the mountains and it looks good but I know that Jesus is my savior and my friend. That he no longer calls me a servant. He's no longer distant, but he calls, me his, he calls me a friend. He calls me a brother. And for God to do the mighty things he wants to do in your life, Jesus has to be that center, that cornerstone. The stone by which you build everything else out of. And there's, there's a difference between that and I add Jesus to a part of my life. Doesn't mean he doesn't love you. Doesn't mean you're not going to heaven. Doesn't mean that, doesn't mean that your life is going to be terrible and he's going to be like, ha, you didn't put me at the center. <laughs> he doesn't say that. But he invites you. He says, Aaron, would you let me into the center of all the things in your life? Will you trust with me? 
When you take everything, all your plans and all your dreams and your health and your family and your vacations and all the things that you want to do that are great, nothing wrong with any of them, but will you put me at the center of those things and see what I can do with them? And that is the first and most important decision I think we make after saying yes to Jesus. And then probably getting married. Just kidding. Is that Jesus, I'm, I'm not only going to have you as my Savior, but I want to have you like Lord, center, cornerstone of my life. That everything that I do is built off that. And then run through that. Not because you're going to be like, well, I don't think, that's, I, I don't think you should do that. Or you're, he's going to be a killjoy. He's not going to let me do the things I want to do. But when Christ is at center, everything is way, way better. The path will still have obstacles, but the Savior will walk you through. Life will still suck at times, but our Savior will guide us through. When Jesus is at the center, I think that's a scarier decision to make than accepting him for eternity. Anybody? That was the scariest decision I ever made. 19 years old, sitting in my car, a 95 uh, Volkswagen Jetta, (laughs) five-speed, sunroof, red, Lots of speeding tickets with that guy. Um, <laughs> sitting in my car listening to some song and just re- realizing that, you know, the more I try to do my life alone, the more things don't really work. And then I said to him, I give you all of myself and I put him in the center. And then pretty much each day, I put him back in the center. And for God to do what he wants to do this year in us, which we're going to talk about more in depth in a second. I was so, so pressed this week that what will happen if you don't put Jesus as a center, and it's, uh, again, it's an ongoing decision we make, right? Is that you will become, di- you'll become disinterested with faith because you'll hear all these messages, like this is what God can do, this is what God can do. Then you'll go back to life and you'll be like, well, this doesn't change anything. I tried to have faith, and I don't know what that means, right? Or you become disengaged with, with, with the Bible or whatever else thing, or why would we lead people towards this thing? It doesn't seem real to me. And God, and, and God never pushes his way into your life. What he a- asks for you, and he asks of you, is say, hey, would you come and would you bring my son into the center of your life? Would you make him the cornerstone? And when, God, when you do that, it invites God to work like you've never seen before. Like, I remember I made that decision, and then I, like, dusted off my Bible one day. I'm like, well, I heard I was supposed to read this thing. I should probably do that. And I remember I opened it up, and I read it. I did one of those flop it open, like, all right, Lord, speak to me. <laughs> and I read it, and I was like, this was re- written for me. For the first time ever. And I was, like, pounded the Bible into my brain my whole childhood. It's still there. But I, for the first time, opened up, this was written for me. And I saw purpose in my relationships. And I saw purpose in what I was trying to do for a career. And I saw a reason for marriage that I didn't see before. It wasn't just so I could finally be not alone anymore, but it was so I could glorify my Father all the more. Because Christ was at the center, and then he defined things. And I didn't chase things that end up maybe okay, but not the best. One of the things I get, I got to move on, holy cow. One of the things that I see so much is that people love the idea of Jesus. I mean, there's no doubt that Jesus existed. Like, very few people don't believe that anymore, right? Like, his teachings are revolutionary. The way he treated women is unbelievable. The way he treated the the sick and people in need and the, the ones in authority, it's unbelievable what he did. But Jesus was not just the man. He was our, he was our king. He's our God. He's our savior. And he asks to be put in the center of your life. And that's really important for God to do what he wants to do this year. And then you'll see purpose and, and a reason by, around everything you do. On everything you do. Okay, we gotta, we gotta roll. Okay. Verse 24, here we go. I'm gonna say it really long and dramatic. I'm not going to. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we pray, O Lord, O Lord. We pray, give us success. Give us, the word actually translates into give us prosperity. Give us abundance. It's like, God, just pour it out. 
Like, we don't even understand. We don't even see. I don't even know what that means. It's something you say in church. Pour it out. But whatever it means, God, however I translate to my life, just, just, I want all of you. I want all of it. Whatever you have for us. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of our Lord. So we believe today is a day, but we believe that this is a day of God's favor. Believe that this is a day of God's favor for us. So the word, this is the day, it, do, it means a, a period of time, like 24 hours, but it also means a peri- like a period of time, that there's a season of God's favor that is given to people. It doesn't mean that after that season, God's favor is like, well, you had it, now you lost it. That's not what it means. But it means for this period of time, for the year of 2018, God has given us his favor, has given you his favor. That this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Because to, it's not just today. It's not just about, like, okay, every day I got to make it count. I got to make it count. But it's understanding that, listen, God has already opened doors and cleared a path and done this thing for us. All we have to do is walk in it each day. And God was showing me, and this is personal, but I think it's for all of us, that I kind of saw this hallway with all these doors. You ever been in like a long office building with like doors and there's a door at the end and whatnot? Like Alice in Wonderland type of thing? I knew that would help. (laughs) Willy Wonka. Um, And uh, I think in, in my life at times, I've given up on some of the things that I feel like God wants to do. And I think at times I've settled for this is the way my, I'm going to be as a father. I'm settled for this is the way I'm going to be as a man. And, maybe, and not, not that it's necessarily bad, but I'm like, well, this is pretty good. And, I, and, and it's, in this corridor of doors are doors that, when I enter them, are like God's best for whatever situation the best employee you can be, the best husband or wife you can be, the best mom or dad you can be, the best student you can be. And I feel like at times I've stopped trying to open the door. And I've just expected it to be locked. I feel like God said so, so specific to me and I think for us, the door is unlocked. Just open it. God's favor is that There is the goodness and mercy of God in all areas of your life. Nothing being left out. And the doors are unlocked. And he said, just come on in. That's what favor looks like. And it seems like we don't deserve it because we don't. And it seems too good to be true, but it's true and it's good. You just go and you open the door. What does health look, what could your health look like? What could your happiness look like? What could you do to impact God's kingdom? What could you do to to help those who are in need around you? That door's unlocked, and God's favor says, it's unlocked, and now you open it. So will you open the door? Because we believe prophetically that God has said, hey, 23, hey, people, hey, all of us together, hey, Aaron, I've given you favor this year because I love you, because you are my children. And I want you to experience me fuller. I want you to experience me more complete. I want every area of your life, I want nothing left out. I don't want you to get to the end of this year and have not opened the doors. Because it's so good. You put my son at the center. You build everything around him. And then watch what I can do. Watch what you can experience. It's an invitation that we do not have to take. I think so much of what it means to be a follower of Jesus is a great invitation constantly in different areas of our lives that we are not required to take because we have free will. But if we do, if we do, then watch out. Like when I was a little kid and God was calling me to be a pastor at eight years old and I was just ticked off in my bed like, I'm not going to do it. (laughs) I could have not done it. And God would still love me. And God would still use me. And God would still do good things. And there would still be a church here. It just wouldn't be me. But God's my, Christ is my center. And I will open every single door that he wants to unlock for me. And that's what he invites you to today. 
This is the day. This now is the moment. This is the day. This is a period of time that he's just given a special anointing of his favor. You can't explain it. Doesn't mean we're better than anyone or worse than anyone or at, at you know, January 1, 2019, the doors are locked. You're done. That doesn't, none of that's true. It means that for some reason, because he loves us, because he's a good dad, and because I think we're trying to be faithful with that, I think we're trying to put Christ at the center, he said, this is a period of time that I am going to show you my goodness and my favor like never before, if you want. This is what the Lord has made, that the Lord of our life, the one that is in control and in care, I put my trust and my care in him. He's created it. There's no accidents in what he wants to do this year, and there's a purpose behind everything. He has prepared these days for you. And the beauty of God is he's prepared days for everyone. Let us together, let us rejoice. Rejoicing is external. Let us proclaim what God has done. Let us be excited. Let's actually smile. Like, hey, it's, this is exciting, right? This is good. Like, you're walking into Starbucks. Smile. It's exciting. God's with us. And be glad, which is Internal. There's nothing worse than trying to be, trying to rejoice without being glad. Trying to put on the happy face with just not having it there. God's favor speaks to, you'll be glad in here, and it'll be real, and then you'll rejoice out there. Today is the day of God's favor for you and for me. Doors are going to be open that uh, you've stopped trying to open you've given up on. And God has opened things for you that I don't know what they are, but you might know what they are, but you might not know. And you might, like, feel God saying something to you, like, hey, I don't know, go talk to your neighbor and start building that relationship. I don't like my neighbor. He's a jerk. You know? And then one day you'll be like, oh, that's why. That's why. Psalm 16, 11. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence, there is a fullness of joy. And at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Sometimes, I think in in Christian world, and as people of Christ, and I think because life's hard, and I think sometimes we just kind of cope and we kind of just survive, we think that things like a fullness of joy and pleasures evermore are kind of like, yeah, right. Yeah, that's fine. Maybe in heaven, we'll, that's, that's heaven. That'll be great. We'll be pleasure forever and we won't cry. It'll be great. I mean, I'm probably going to cry, but like happy tears, you know? But I always cry happy tears, so whatever. But I think, I think the thing that separates us from the rest of the world is we have, and we should have, a fullness of joy. And I think that can, the thing that can be the most attractive to those who are lost or those who are chasing everything else and trying to get as fit as they can for what reason, which isn't bad, but what reason, or trying to get as successful as they can, which isn't bad, but for what reason, or trying to have the perfect family, which isn't bad, but for what reason. And ultimately at night, when you lay down at, in, at, in your bed, you know that that does not bring you fullness of joy. And I think we have this opportunity together to have this fullness of joy and have a pleasurable, exciting, happy, fulfilled life. And any type of teaching about God, you know, like God's about suffering, you know? Like we experience suffering in Christ, but even in suffering, Jesus says, consider it pure joy. And so we have an opportunity to let the favor of God not only just transform us and change us each day, just opening doors left and right. But also for that gladness of our heart to turn to rejoicing so that people would know and see who our Savior is. I, I don't think any of us got into church world or because we think it's just a great little club. But I think, for me, I got into it because I just love Jesus. I don't want other people to love him. And I want other people to be fulfilled. And I'm sick of seeing other people destroyed. I'm sick of seeing people put all their energy and their effort into things that will not last. And I just want to see people love Jesus. And then do those other things and have a blast. So this is what we're going to do this year. 
to connect the community we live in to the Christ we love. I, I drew this little thing again. You want to see it? It has circles. Look at that. Be impressed. PowerPoint. Um, so the, what we believe is, is that to connect the community we live in to the Christ that we love, it's not me. It's not even, it's us corporately, but it's you and I individually. We are his body. We are a part of his. And when we work together and when we do our own part, it's just a beautiful thing. And when, and, and to, I think to be a fulfilled follower of Jesus that does that, to connect people to Christ, it means that you know him personally. And then you, we, have, we grow in relationships that people don't get. Like, you really love each other, for real? That's not based on anything? Yeah, just him. And then we, we share Christ together. When we do all those things, at whatever stage we do that, it might be one inch here, six inches here, you know, a, 10 feet here. It's, it's not the point. You don't graduate from one to the other. Like, once you know Jesus and know a bunch about the Bible, then you can have good relationships. Then you can tell people about Jesus, right? That's how it was when I grew up. Well, you don't know enough. You can't do this. The disciples were the biggest idiots on earth. Let's just be honest. And the thing that transformed them was the Holy Spirit's work in their heart. And in a moment, they were just, they went and transformed them. They did, a, they did a couple of things. They knew Christ together personally. And, and then they had these, in Acts 2, this profound community of people that loved each other and were there for each other and went through good and bad and persecution and suffering. And all the while, God added to their numbers. And all the while, God blessed them. And all the while, there was a joy that was unstoppable. And in a second, all of a sudden, they started telling everyone about this man that, that they had seen die. He was the Savior. And people were getting saved, and people were getting healed, and this thing happened, and it's still happening to this day. Because of a bunch of teenagers who experienced Jesus. So God doesn't care about how deep you know your theology. Right? God doesn't care how many Bible verses you have memorized. Do those things. That's great. Have those things in your heart. What God desires for you is a relationship. So this is what we believe, that when you know Christ, when you grow and you share, these are the things that we feel like God's placed on our heart. So I think that that's a pretty vague thing. All right, everyone, know Jesus. All right, have a good week. Talk to you later. All right, grow together. Be friends. See ya. You know, we did the kids sometimes. Be nice. I don't know what that means. How do you be nice, you know? Go share Jesus. Oh my gosh, are you kidding me? Share? Like, what? Repent, sinner? Don't just say that. Does that count? Don't say what that's saying. <laughs> don't say that. I'll give you ten dollars if you don't say that. <laughs> so we were like, okay, what does that mean for us? What do those words mean for us? And what can we what do they mean more specifically? Because I think it's hard to just kind of think this. So we really feel as we prayed and we fasted and we sought God, just as much as we feel like God has given us favor over this year. So what does that mean for us? So under note, we're gonna talk about these in depth next week, so I'm just gonna talk about it. We really feel like the most important thing about knowing Jesus is experiencing his voice in a real and profound way. That, 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 that you're going to have moments and you're going to experience, maybe not like this audible voice of God, but that, but that like, oh my gosh, God is here. Or, oh my gosh, I think that's him. That, is it me? Is it him? It's, it's probably him. You know? We think the most important way is not reading your Bible. And the most important way to know Jesus is not to pray. The most important way to know Jesus is not to worship. The most important way to know him is to experience his voice. To know that he speaks to you and he is with you. And you do that through prayer. And you do that through, through the word, absolutely. And you do that through worship. But if you build your basis of your relationship with God on praying, reading your Bible, and worshiping, it will become either ritualistic, or one day God will speak and you'll be like, well, I guess God's not with me. Or you'll miss it three days because you're busy. Oh, God hasn't been with me. And in no way has that ever been the point. God has given us these tools and these things to experience him. And it's to help. But if, you don't, if we don't engage God, that he wants to speak with you. He wants to be in connection with you personally. No matter what you've done. No matter where you're at. No matter how much you think. He will not speak. He wants to connect to you. And he wants to. We want, you, we want to teach you. We want to work together on how do we experience his voice. I'll talk about prayer. But the last 20 years or so, we've been pounding the people, have a quiet time, read your Bible, pray more, and it hasn't produced 
more intimacy with Jesus. But if I think God is with me, I'm going to experience him now. And then when I read, it's written for me. When I pray, I understand that he is here. When I worship, I understand that this is for him. And that might mess up with your religion. The basis of your faith is not your quiet time or your devotion. The basis of your faith is intimacy with Jesus. Hands down. Hands down. I heard a story this week, and I, this, this guy was like talking about just being with God, which is a little bit more nebulous, right? It's easier to be like, all right, I prayed today, chapter did that, I'm awesome. Read the Bible, oh, two chapters, right? <laughs> and he was a pastor. He's like, how much have you prayed this week? How much have you read? How much have you read this week? And, the, and this kid, he was like this youth pastor, really, this kid, he's like, I didn't know we're timing it. I didn't know it was time. I don't know. You know, he was just like freaked out. And, and what, what he realized is that we're putting too much emphasis on the time, and less emphasis on the experience. Because when you experience Jesus, a minute can feel like a month. But you can sit in that for a long time, and it feels like just nothing. And then all those things are super important. The Word of God is His voice that's breathed on the pages, it's sharper than a two-inch sword, it separates, it speaks truth, believe it. The Spirit of God moves through prayer and intercession and through through His Spirit moves when we pray. The worship is so profound, I believe that, but if we don't experience His voice, we don't experience Him in it, it's a crashing gong, it's a claiming symbol, and you'll check something off a list, and you'll wonder what you've met with our Savior. Except that. That's next week. <laughs> next one is we believe what it, to grow, you have to build durable relationships. Uh, starting at the end of this month, we're, in, we're doing a series called Fight For. Basically, our culture fights about everything, but rarely does our culture fight for anything. We're talking about what does it mean to fight for the marriage you want, or fight for the single life you want fight for the parenting you want, or fight for the friendships you want. And we believe that when you have durable relationships, that's when you really, it's the most attractive thing to people who are outside the church, outside the body. They're like, that you can have conflict, that you can disagree, that you might see I, 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 that there's a deep love and respect and connection, and I can call this person that, that and they're going to be there, I know, like this morning, I have a person that fundamentally we believe so differently about things but in a second, I called them and they came over to help because we have durable relationships. And I don't care what we disagree on. I don't care how much I blood or how much you blood. I will be there for you and we will be, you will be there for me because that is what the body of Christ does. And that's what Jesus does. And we're talking about what does it mean to have durable, I love that word, durable, gritty, loving relationships. Guys would love that, like tough, blood. <laughs> you say blood like that, you're like, yeah, I don't mind. <laughs> the last thing in sharing, what is it, what's the most important part about sharing? Is that we, what we're going to focus on is how do you share a story with your neighbor? Remember, your neighbor is God, who God's put in your life. It's, not, it's your neighbor, literally. It's also the people you see every day. People in your classes, the people that you work with, it's the people that you see in coffee shops. I see lots of people in coffee shops. Um, those are my neighbor. And Jesus says, when they ask him, who is your neighbor? And he, he makes the example of the most hated person ever. That's your neighbor. Love them. And we think that there's power in story. Whether it's your story of faith, whether it's listening to their story, but why, what the, what's going on in their world. Whether it's a story of God, whether it's a story about what, who the King of Kings is, we think that there's power in story. We think rather than be like, okay, to lead someone to Christ, you have to do A, B, C. Right? Because if I ask each one of you how you connected to Jesus, it's going to be different. I guarantee you that. You know, the most important thing that we do is help people respond to Jesus. The most important thing we do to people, for people is help them to respond to Jesus. Because I believe that I don't change anyone's heart. You don't change anyone's heart. Only Jesus changes their heart. And the Spirit of God is working in people all throughout their day and their week. And then I'm put in their life for a moment, for a year, for a week, whatever. And then I get an opportunity to help people respond to him the way he designed them to respond. For me, it was Volkswagen Jetta. I did. 
thank you for that. For you, or for that person, it might be a group prayer, it might be, it might be, it might be creation, but our job is to tell people the story of God and tell it to our neighbors. Rather than trying to be like, okay, we gotta reach more people, we gotta go out, we gotta find more, we gotta find more. I, God spoke so clearly to me, why would you find more? I've already given you so many. He's like, I'm like, God, I need to find more people. Who's your neighbor? I'm like, everyone's my neighbor. He's like, who is your literal neighbor? Okay, thanks, God. <laughs> and there's like 10 names for my literal neighbors. That is who I'm called to love and to serve and to show people Jesus. So we're going to teach you this year. What does it mean to share your story, to share the best story? And what is it, and who is your neighbor? And we'll talk about that forever, so get used to it. I'm really excited about this. I think that rather than talking about a bunch of things a little bit, we're going to like really dig into what does it mean to experience God's voice? Do, I really, do you really believe that God wants to speak to you? And he will give you direction. What does it mean to have really durable relationships? Like January 1, 2019, you're going to look back and be like, this is the marriage I thought I could have. Do you believe that? January 1, 2019, like, man, I'm a lot less angry at my kids. Praise the Lord. January 1, 2019, I feel like I have such, I have a community of people that I never thought I could ever have. I have, so one door for some of you is like, I, there's, this, there's, a, there's a depth of friendship I've never experienced. There's a de depth of connection and intimacy and friendship that I've never had before. And everything I've had has been based on my performance or the way I looked, the way I presented, or if I was cool enough or whatever. God says, no one can open that door, we're gonna leave all that there. And I think for the first time, you're gonna see God use you to connect people to him. So it all starts with this question. It always comes back to this question. No matter how spiritual you are, how much you know about the Bible, it all comes down to this. Is Jesus the center? If Jesus is the center, <coughs> buckle up. The doors are unlocked. We ask that you would walk through them. Jesus, we ask that you bless this, this group. Thank you for your heart and for this group. Just, just this time now as you pray, just let, let God show you but she loves you. God, I pray that that first and foremost, most importantly, God, that every person here would just say, kind of take a take a little inventory. Jesus, where are you at in my world? Are you added to a list of things I value? Are you added to a list of things I believe? Or, or are you the center? It doesn't mean that you love, I, you know, he's gonna love you any more or less but it's about his favor working in your heart. Because this year, he has given us favor. Believe it or not, he is going to open doors, believe it or not. And we can walk through him and experience more than we ever have. But if Christ is the center, what can he do? So here's where you respond to Jesus. As we sing this song, but here's how you respond to him. That he is alive and he's going he's gonna to speak. And he's going to ask be centered? Can I be the thing that is built around? Everything else is built around. Just take your time as you pray here. Just make, make that decision. 